In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Veni, Sancti Spiritus, Repletuorum, Corda Fidelium, et Tui Amoris Rei, Signum Accende, et Mite Spiritum Tuum, et Creabuntur. Orimus Deus, qui corda fidelium, sancti spiritus illus rationi ducovisti, dano missioni ordin spiritu recta sapere, et de eus sembra consolazioni godere prequistum dominum nostrum. Sere sapientiae, in nomine Patris et Fidii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. So yesterday, the last thing we saw was that Henry VIII pulled out of the the archives, uh, dusted off the old laws of Premunire, the statutes of Premunire. which forbade the publication of certain papal decrees without the consent of the royal power in England, which had fallen into disuse and was effectively no longer a law even. <clears throat> the practical order, it never was. Maybe it was still on the books, but it was effectively no longer in force. But Henry VIII remembered that these, these statutes when he decided it was time for him to bring about his own revolution against the church. So he brought this particular charge against the whole body of the clergy in the beginning of the year 1531, at the instigation of Cromwell. Yes. Oh, there's a, you'd have to do a, a research into English legislation to find the exact year that that was first put on the books. But yes. I just said that it was forbidden to publish certain papal decrees in England without the assent of the royal authority. So the king had to give his consent to certain papal decrees. And that was the law. Um, it's not saying that the church necessarily gave way to that. The church the, at certain times had given concessions of, of, of a similar nature. In other words, allowing the monarchs to nominate bishops or allowing them a, maybe perhaps a veto power. In other words, that if they couldn't nominate, then they could say, we don't, we don't want this particular person in that sea. So that was not unheard of. So perhaps at one point the church had ceded to this, you'd have to do more research into these statutes in order to find out. But that's a little bit outside the scope of what we're talking about here. We're just talking about how Henry VIII took advantage of these old laws, which were effectively not even laws anymore, as far as the practical order. So he brought you know, this charge against the whole body of the clergy in the year 1531 at the instigation of Cromwell. The case was opened and sentence pronounced against the whole episcopate. So everybody was just receiving you know, decrees from the Pope and taking possession of, of sees without any you know, consent of the royal power, and that was done for a long time. Nobody had any problem with it. But now Henry VIII brings that up as soon as he wants to get a divorce and steal all the property of the church in his realm. So an obvious insincerity, it's just a pretext. So in an effort to s smooth things over, a deputation from the clergy offered a present of 100,000 pounds in return for a full pardon. So hoping to resolve the situation, they say, all right, fine, we'll, we'll admit to being guilty uh, by a technicality by this law, so we'll, you know, we'll pay for receiving a pardon, and then we'll just move on. But in, that's assuming, they're, they're assuming, that Henry's actually sincere in this, that he's enforcing a law that he wants to bring back and that he'll actually abide by it, <laughs> that he would be reasonable and grant a pardon uh, for so violating a law which was effectively not even uh, in force anymore and that they could then continue normally after that. Um, whether they actually thought they would succeed or not, uh, perhaps not, but it was certainly an, an, an attempt to resolve the situation. 
But the king was not satisfied with the money. He refused the proposal, unless, in the preamble to the grant, a clause were inserted acknowledging the king as the protector and only supreme head of the church and clergy of England. So he would only accept it on that condition. And of course, no Catholic could uh, uh, concede that. So, as a response to that, the Archbishop of Canterbury, whose name was Warham, if you want to know how to spell that, there it is. He proposed an amendment to that preamble in the following terms. He said, we acknowledge his majesty to be the chief protector, the only and supreme lord, and as far as the law of Christ will allow, the supreme head of the church and the clergy of England. So he wants to qualify it in an attempt to make it acceptable for Catholics to sign. The restriction contained in the, in the words, as far as the law of Christ will allow, was the only ground on which the Catholic bishops could sign the proposition. So they were willing to sign it based on that. But you know, that's assuming that Henry would uh, grant this uh, concession to them. That he would, he would allow them, he would come to a compromise on this. That he would essentially refrain from taking uh, or claiming rights that were not his authority, that is not his. Uh, that he would concede that he's asking too much in order for them to sign this. But we'll see whether he was willing to do that or not. They understood their position, and as a more precise definition of the sense in which they gave their signatures, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of Durham added, their, added to their names a more explicit declaration. In these words, if this clause mean only that the king is the head in temporals, meaning in temporal matters, why all this formality, since everyone grants it already? If it mean that he is the head in spirituals, meaning in spiritual matters, it is contrary to the, the, to the doctrine of the Catholic Church, outside of which there is no salvation. I therefore protest against the latter sense, and submit all to the judgment of our, of our Holy Mother the Church. I call upon all present to witness my dissent from it, and demand that this protest be entered among the acts of the Convocation. So they're saying, essentially, this, the, they're... they're Almost say, not quite with these words, of course, but almost they're almost saying that this is we're just trying to patch things up here. We're not conceding anything new. We're we're signing this because it's been amended so that we can sign it, and we're we're not granting the king anything he doesn't already have. Uh, we're just trying to smooth things over, and they're for the fact they're explicitly saying that if this were to be construed in any way to mean that we're granting the king something new, in other words, being the head of the church, the only head of the church, in other words, uh, of course, the king doesn't have any juris uh, ecclesiastical jurisdiction anyway, but not only, uh, uh, so he might have some influence, like um, being allowed to, you know, we'd have, you'd have to look to see what exactly was permitted by the church at the time, but perhaps he was allowed to, say, nominate bishops or something, uh, but uh, they, that's not, of course, that's not an act of jurisdiction. So uh, they're, they're completely denying that the king has, uh, is the head, certainly the head of the church, but even really that he has any uh, ecclesiastical jurisdiction whatsoever. Though at this point, Henry was wavering and irresolute. He was trying to intimidate the court of Rome. He was trying to essentially scare the pope into getting his divorce. Uh, he had not yet determined to separate completely from union with Rome. So he, he hadn't quite resolved to go into schism just yet. He's, he's trying scare tactics at this point. Though he found that he could not terrify the Pope into the approbation of the divorce, and so he now took a decidedly hostile stand. And it was on January 25th, 1533, that uh, one of the royal chaplains received orders to celebrate mass in a retired apartment at the, S at the western end of the palace of Whitehall. So that's January uh, 25th, 1533. A priest who functions as a chaplain to the king 
is re is ordered to celebrate mass early in the morning in a, in a, in a uh, retired like like a private chapel really and the purpose was for the the marriage supposedly of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn and the reason that they were so eager to do it was because they were afraid of an illegitimate birth because Anne was already expecting a child by Henry at this point now, the chaplain, discovering what he was being ordered to do, he made some opposition. So he realizes that this is, uh, he realizes what's going on here, just the, the tremendous evil of this. Uh, but Henry calmed his supposed scruples. Of course, this is not a scruple. This is a legitimate uh, objection by the assurance that the Pope had pronounced in his favor and that the papal document granting this to him was safely deposited in his closet. And also, uh, Archbishop Warham had died, leaving the See of Canterbury vacant. And it was, of course, in the interest of Henry to fill the See of Canterbury, which is the, the primary See of England, the, uh, the, the most important uh, diocese in the country, uh, with somebody uh, who would be his own creature, someone who would push his own agenda. So with this view, he bestowed the bishopric upon uh, the infamous Thomas Cranmer. So Warren's dead. Now it's this monster Thomas Cranmer who comes in. When we say that the king bestowed the bishopric upon him, most likely that means that he was nominated, that he nominated him, and that the Holy See confirmed him, most likely. He was, this Cranmer was, yes. Sorry, what to no, she was, she was sent away. She went back to Spain, actually. And she, she died actually faithful to Henry. She never, uh, she never pretended that her marriage was invalid. So at a certain point, of course, you know, it's looking at, we're getting a, getting a bit of ahead of ourselves, but of course, Henry, the, Henry VIII tried to marry about six different times. And uh, after a while, at a certain point, while he was you know, maybe on number four or five, something like that, three or four, I'm, I don't know, you'd have, to, you'd have to look at the timeline of uh, uh, Catherine of Aragon's life when she died and Henry VIII's various marriages, whether real or false, valid or invalid. But at a certain point, he started marrying validly again because she died. So then he, he he tried to marry somebody else after that and then probably killed her and tried to marry somebody else. So uh, at a certain point, he started marrying validly. Uh, after Catherine, and Catherine died, he married somebody else whom he most likely put to death and then tried marrying again after that, at least once. So just degenerated to the state of a monster, yes. So not not if say you you someone a man were to say kill another man in order to marry that man's wife no that would be invalid that that is invalid and that's act that holds true even if the person who carries out that murder for that purpose doesn't know it invalidating laws hold true even if the person affected by it doesn't know that such a law exists yes Yeah, that that would be that would be valid. You know, gravely illicit, and of course, under normal circumstances, such a person would be you know, tried and executed for murder. But you know, as far as but if the person were to get away with it, yes, the the marriage would be valid. And in fact, it was because of that very thing that in the Old Testament, that bills of divorce were allowed to the Jews because they tended to kill their wives in order to marry somebody else. But okay, in the Old Testament, things were a bit different. Uh, for example, there's a famous case of King David in his uh, sudden and rather spectacular fall. He, uh, had, of course, had a man. He didn't kill him personally, but he had him killed in order to marry uh, that man's uh, wife. And uh, at the time, that was, that was valid. The laws were different uh, under the Old Covenant. Uh, but now the laws of the church... Uh, say that you know, 
someone who brings about the death of someone of some other person in order to marry that person's spouse, that marriage, that and that that person would then attempt would be invalid. Yes. 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 Yeah, it's, it's precisely in order to prevent that sort of thing that the church has laid down that law. And once again, that, that marriage would be invalid even if the person has no idea that such a law exists. So, though Thomas Cranmer was himself of, her author says, more than questionable uh, morality. So in other words, he was filthy himself. After he entered holy orders, he married, or at least attempted to marry, uh, the granddaughter of a prominent Lutheran in Germany. So, he's filthy too. Though he kept that secret, Cranmer kept that secret, and uh, even taking the greatest precautions to hide his immorality from the public. But it still meant that he had a secret leaning toward Protestant doctrines, and had... Uh, made himself prominent in England uh, by being one of those who wrote in favor of Henry's divorce. So again, Cranmer was named, as, I, uh, as, we, as we suspected, familiar to the vacant archbishopric. Uh, the nomination was approved by the Pope, so it was the case of the king nominating and the Pope approving. And again, that's, that's the only arrangement uh, that, well, it's a type of arrangement that the church can permit uh, the temporal authority doesn't have any power to bestow spiritual authority, ecclesiastical jurisdiction. That's not possible. The most the, the civil authority can do is uh, give an, uh, make a nomination, or perhaps the, the church might grant a veto power. In other words, we won't grant uh, ecclesiastical jurisdiction to this person if the civil authority doesn't want it. So that's possible. It's possible, as we're seeing here, for a monarch to nominate someone. Uh, but not possible for the temporal authority to bestow civil, uh, uh, sorry, for the civil authority to bestow ecclesiastical jurisdiction, which is the reason why there was contention in previous centuries between uh, the Pope and various monarchs, and most notably the Holy, some of the Holy Roman emperors, uh, over uh, lay investiture. In other words, the practice of, of uh, lay temporal rulers bestowing the symbols of ecclesiastical jurisdiction upon uh, bishops. Say they were the ceremony in which the king or the emperor would bestow like, the, 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 the crozier and the mitre on, uh, on, on a bishop. That was a, an abuse because it gave the impression that the ecclesiastical jurisdiction was being bestowed, which is not the case. At the very most, the, that person would, be, would have been nominated and then the jurisdiction then given, uh, uh, granted by the Holy See. So again, the Pope approved him because he was apparently ignorant of his scandalous behavior, which he admittedly was, had been kept quiet. And of course, remember at the time, he's doing everything he can to try to prevent England from going into schism, Pope Clement VII. So you know, it's understandable, of course, it was in itself, we'd know a very bad decision to confirm Cranmer, but uh, at the time, it seems that he didn't know if, if, if he knew that he, if he had any idea that Cranmer was, any, was something less than ideal, he most likely did not know to what extent. And he's also do, trying to do everything he can to um, keep Henry from bringing all of England into schism, which we're seeing at this point is a very real danger. So the new primate inaugurated, that means Cranmer, the new primate inaugurated his power. So his, the f first thing he does, or at least the first notable thing he does, uh, is to write a letter to the king concerning his incestuous union with Catherine of Aragon. Again, Henry asserting that this union was incestuous because he said, oh, I married my sister-in-law, that, that, that's incestuous. But again, the marriage, uh, Catherine's marriage with Henry's brother Arthur was never consummated, and on those grounds, the Pope, Pope Julius II, granted a dispensation for them to marry, which is valid and licit. That's, that's well within papal jurisdiction, of course to grant such a dispensation. Uh, but Cranmer says that a union, call, or calls this supposedly incestuous union, a union which has given great scandal and which we have also resolved for the peace of our own conscience to break off by every canonical means in our power. So he's, 
immediately showing himself to be precisely what Henry wants him to be, a creature of the king. In other words, somebody who pushes uh, the, the royal agenda or a personal agenda of Henry VIII in this case uh, for the purpose of getting this divorce. Specifically for getting this divorce, but um, he wouldn't mind it if he were to get his support in other things too. So the king uh, consented to receive this admonition from the uh, supposedly... Uh, so <laughs> or the author is it's interesting. He says facetiously that the king most graciously consented to receive this admonition from the most from the from the pious primate of his kingdom. So they're putting on a show and on, on a pretense of of piety and submission. Oh yes, no, I see. Uh, I, you know, Your Majesty, I, I have to admonish you that your 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 union is incestuous. You need to separate from from your wife, and this is terrible. And the king's oh yes, very very submissive. Oh yes, yes. I, I'm, I'm submitting to this, this, this clerical admonition. I should do that, yes. So he said, We deem it necessary for the good of our soul to yield without delay to the representations of our spiritual father, the Archbishop of Canterbury. So apparently the, the Pope is no longer the spiritual father of, of the church. Apparently not. It's now the Archbishop of Canterbury. No, this is clear. It's all hypocritical and pretentious uh, and all with an agenda. There's not one word of any of this is sincere. So Cranmer, as you would expect, asked to be allowed at once to institute an ecclesiastical procedure against Catherine. Now he wants to set up a tribunal to declare that the marriage was invalid. So Cranmer opened his court and summoned the king and queen to appear before him. Catherine paid no heed to the iniquitous summons. Yes. Oh yes, he went through with it because he, well, he was for one thing he was lied to. He said, "Yeah, oh no, it's fine." The, the Pope said it's okay. So yes, they went through with the ceremony. He had, he had supposedly married Anne Boleyn by this point. Again, for the purpose of, you know, of course, remember, Henry is doing this, f among other reasons, for the purpose of getting a male heir. And in, in order to, for uh, whatever offspring he might have by Anne Boleyn f to be considered legitimate, they would have to be married. So again, if the king goes off and has an illegitimate child, that child would not be considered in line for the throne, not, not really being a member of the royal family, just being a child that the king had with some other woman, which would be the case if this child were to be born before uh, they, would, they were married, that child would be considered illegitimate. So they need to be married before the child is born for that purpose. So that's why they were in such a rush to do that, yes. Well, apparently it's considered from the state of like the, the marital status of the parents at the birth of the child. At least, at least as far as royal succession goes. The laws of the church, um, we'd have to look at that. But apparently as far as royal succession, as long as the, the parents were married at the time the child was born, the child was considered legitimate. Yes? Yes. Well, legitimate or illegitimate? What was the question again? Yes. 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 Yeah, so that is that is yes. That is not the any child that is not the offspring of a valid marriage. Yes, is uh, illegitimate. Although uh, uh, at the same time, though, there is so uh, this is this is interesting. Uh, there is such a thing as uh, called a sanatio in radice. Again, this is. Getting a, this doesn't have anything to do directly with what we're talking about, but it is good to know. It's general ecclesiastical knowledge. It's called Sanatio in Radice. This is a case in which yeah, marriage was invalid because of some impediment. But at the same time, children were born to it, to that union. Uh, but again, the marriage is invalid. The children are considered illegitimate. But if, the, if this process were to be uh, activated and the, the marriage would be then considered to be, and the marriage, of course, would have to be validated, uh, 
if this were to be applied, it would mean that retroactively those children would have been considered legitimate from the beginning. In other words, the marriage would be legally considered to have been valid. Of course, nothing can change the fact that the sacrament did not exist before a certain time. But it's, it's like a, a legal fixing of the problem. So those children would all be considered legitimate from the beginning. So, for example, there would not then be the impediment, which actually is an impediment uh, for receiving, cer certainly for receiving the episcopate, but even technically for the priesthood, uh, for, uh, it's an impediment to be illegitimate to receive for rece receiving the priesthood. You'd have to receive a dispensation from that. So in that case, if the parents were to do the sanatio and the radice, then none of their sons would need that dispensation to receive the priesthood. Again, but again, it's like uh, so you, might, you, might, you might almost call it a legal fiction that the marriage was not valid until you know, the, until well, until you know, it was something it was rectified, and the children were illegitimate, born illegitimately. But the law doesn't see that anymore. The law just sees a valid marriage from the beginning because they went through this process. Again, the sanatio and radice, it's like a, like a cleansing or, or fixing. In the, in, in the root, that's what it means. In other words, at the beginning. Legally, the marriage is considered to have been valid from the beginning. So, and of course, that requires ecclesiastical jurisdiction to do that. But such a thing does exist. But again, uh, this, is, this has nothing to do <laughs> directly with what we're talking about. And also, one other thing for which that's interesting is it shows that something might be true before the law, but not in reality. So somebody could be, you know, in reality, guilty of murder, but never convicted of it, for example. Or, as in our current situation, someone might be supposedly elected to the papacy, but never received that jurisdiction. So... Catherine of Aragon refused to show up for this farce of a trial, this farce of a tribunal whose outcome is clearly predetermined. So she ignores these iniquitous summons. The archbishop then, very predictably, pronounced her contumacious, and in consequence, judgment was given against her, stating that the marriage between her and Henry was null and invalid, and this judgment he pronounced, supposedly, at any rate, in virtue of his apostolic authority as legate of the Holy See, which he claimed as tributary of the principal see of Canterbury. So yes, that's right. The Pope is absolutely refusing to grant this annulment, but he claims to grant it anyway by virtue of the authority granted to him by the Holy See. Totally absurd, yes. But as we've seen, people who engage in revolution against the church, or really any revolution, are not... They're not known for their uh, esteem for uh, defending their positions very reasonably. They're not known for uh, for coming up with a coherent explanation for what they're doing. So, then again, they pick up their or their pretenses of piety and of concern for the moral law. Uh, the decision was communicated to the king by the primate, who, with much gravity, exhorted him to submit to the will of God, and made known to him by a sentence given conformably to the laws of the Holy Church, which is, of course, a load of nonsense. And then it was at that point that Henry f officially announced uh, his marriage with Anne Boleyn, and the hypocritical prelate confirmed the adultery in virtue of the authority which he held from the successor of the apostles. So the sham continues. And then it was on the 23rd of March, 1534, so well after a year after Henry carries out what seems to be a secret uh, ceremony for his supposed marriage to Anne Boleyn. This is uh, March of 1534. that Pope Clement VII held a solemn consistory in which he clearly explained the question of the divorce and the, and the negotiations to which it had given rise. So there were 22 cardinals present for this. Of those, 19 pronounced in favor of the validity of the union with Catherine of Aragon, and only three were in favor of a further delay. <clears throat> 
So nobody says that he's, uh, and he considers that marriage to have been invalid. 19 say, no, absolutely it was valid. We don't need to think about this anymore. Three say, well, we, need, well, we should maybe you know, consider these matters a bit more. But 19 of them out of 22 say, no, absolutely it was valid. So according to the opinion of so numerous a majority, Clement VII pronounced a definitive sentence declaring the marriage of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon lawful and valid, condemning the proceedings against Catherine as unjust and tyrannical. Somebody knock here. We're in the middle of a very edifying discussion about Henry VIII. So, 19 out of 22 cardinals voting in favor of the validity of the marriage of Catherine of Aragon, Pope Clement VII condemned the proceedings against Catherine as unjust and tyrannical and ordered the king to take her back as his legitimate wife. So if we couldn't tell already that Cranmer's claims of exercising apostolic jurisdiction or apostolic authority or his own primatial jurisdiction in virtue of uh, receiving it uh, by, from the apostolic authority or bogus, then we see here clearly that the Pope is declaring the exact opposite. So, of course, 19 out of 22 cardinals voting yes in favor of validity doesn't in any way bind the Pope. Uh, because of course, the marriage itself invalid before God. And in any case, uh, a Pope doesn't have to consult uh, with anybody before you know, making a or at least in matters of faith before making an infallible declaration. Uh, but the point, I'm, the point I'm making is that the cardinals aren't, it's not, we shouldn't be taking the sense that they're binding the Pope. So they're, they're giving their opinions, uh, which of course, they're, they're more than opinions. I mean, this is a certitude. <laughs> the marriage is valid. And they're just stating that fact that they recognize it. And the Pope pronounces uh, in accordance with that uh, general consensus, which is of course the true one. So before the pontifical bull reached England, Henry had already sent to both houses, so the houses of parliament, uh, a bull, uh, or sorry, a bill abolishing the power of the Pope within the English realm, and the schism, the fruit of impurity, avarice, and ambition was consummated. So England is 100% schismatic at this point, or at least the king is, and he wants to take the whole realm in that direction. Uh, but it's become officially part of English law that the Pope has no authority in England. So that bad news, this bit of unhappy intelligence, reached Rome simultaneously with that which announced the defection of Switzerland under the leadership of Calvin. So I, I don't know the date of uh, this news reaching Rome or, or in what time frame that happened, but that must have been a dark time. The remedy for such an accumulation of evils, our author says, would have been a general council, which was now called for by the united voice of the whole Catholic world. So everybody's saying to the Holy See at this time, we really need a council to set things straight here. Things are going very, very badly wrong in many places, in Germany, in England, and Switzerland. Clement had actually taken measures to convoke a general council, but the endless wars between Charles V and Francis I made his efforts useless. And also, by the way, Charles V, that, that was his, that's his title, as, as, or his number, rather, his, his numeral as emperor. As king of Spain, he was Charles I. He was King Charles I of Spain, um, uh, Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. But again, he had uh, actually considerably more power as king of Spain. He was actually king of Spain, whereas the Holy Roman Emperor exercised, exercised a rather limited influence over the states of the, that made up the empire. So broken down by multiplied reverses, discouraged by the struggles of his stormy pontificate, and filled with fear for the present and apprehension for the future, Clement VII went to his grave on September 25th, 1534. So that is Pope Clement VII, whose reign was, of course, as we've seen, uh, marked by mostly unhappy events.
So now we move on to Pope Paul III. Dates are October 15th, 1534, until November 10th, 1549. So he was of the noble Tuscan house of Farnese, and he had the confidence of various popes, uh, Julius II, Leo X, and their successors. So he was uh, already prominent, had been prominent for a long time before his election. He was not like, as sometimes happens, like a monk uh, in a monastery elected because they couldn't agree on anybody else. He was definitely a prominent nobleman or of a noble family, who was uh, already prominent in the hierarchy of the church. And the tiara was bestowed upon him by the unanimous vote of the sacred college. So everybody, all the cardinals who voted in there, in that conclave, voted for him. And also, for the record, the reason that we know up to a certain point uh, how many votes went to each person and why we don't know after a certain point is because for a long time those conclaves were not kept secret. Uh, St. Pius X was the one who, who legislated that the conclaves be secret in order to prevent uh, any outside interference. Because it was actually due to outside interference that he was elected. <laughs> you may have heard the story that it was Emperor Franz Josef. Well, it looked like Cardinal Rampola was going to be elected in that conclave. But the, the Austro-Hungarian Emperor Franz Josef didn't like him because uh, the, story, the, the back story is... Uh, um, I'll outside what we're talking about, but uh, he didn't like Cardinal Ron Paul, suffice it to say. So he vetoed his election. He said, you can't elect him. A power which it seems he actually may have had you know, as being, because the Holy Roman Emperors had that power and the Austro-Hungarian Emperors were considered the successors to the Holy Roman Emperors. So uh, he vetoed Cardinal Ron Paul. So after that, Cardinal Ron Paul was yeah, there, there, at the time, there was some doubt as to whether that actually was the case, whether he actually had that authority. But as soon as something like that happens, uh, he's, a, he's effectively finished. So as a result, then Cardinal Sarto was elected, St. Pius X, who immediately decided, said, all right, conquests will be secret, so we don't know who's winning uh, after if it takes multiple ballots. And so, and he abolished it also, they no veto powers. <laughs> so he abolished the reasons that he was elected. So... Uh, but again, keeping in mind, of course, being a saint, in his own mind, his election was not a good thing. <laughs> if we realize it was probably the best thing that happened to the church in the 20th century, but uh, in his own mind, it was the worst thing that ever happened in the world. So that's why we know up until the beginning of the 20th century, how many, in, in many cases, the early records, uh, this cardinal received that many votes, this cardinal received that many votes, etc. And yet, But after St. Pius X, none of that. In fact, they burned those ballots obviously to make the spoke to declare when the election is over or when the, when the conclave has been successful in electing a pope. So Clement VII had said on his deathbed, if the papacy were hereditary, we would bequeath the tiara to Cardinal Farnese. So he was pr practically his handpicked successor. So Pope Paul III's first steps were to or his first step was to appoint commissioners for the execution of reforms in the chancery, the penitentiary, and the apostolic chamber. So he immediately sets about reforming uh, the, the, essentially the administration of the Holy See. So under his influence, the Camaldolese, who are monks, a religious order, the Franciscans, and the Capuchins at once entered upon a course of strict reform. Does anybody know of a pope who was a Camaldolese monk? <laughs> 
It was much later. You know? Yes, that's right. Who hated railroads, for the record. <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, Pope Gregory the Sixteenth was the Kamal Delis. Which, of course, well, and also he's, uh, and we'll see that uh, after a certain point, uh, it almost went back and forth one pope to another who, who tended to uh, grant concessions to civil powers and try to reconcile with them and who was, who was hard on them and, and held fast to the rights of the church, uh, even ones that you know, the church could conceivably compromise on in the face of, the, uh, of these temporal uh, d demands from temporal authorities from civil authorities, and he was, of course, being a monk, uh, not overly concerned with diplomatic matters, he was very definitely uh, a hardliner. <laughs> he didn't care about diplomacy. He, he knew his job was to rule the church, so he did that. <laughs> he didn't care particularly what the civil rulers thought. And then it was after him that Pope Pius IX was elected as you know, a softliner in response, but then in his efforts to you know, you know, be conciliatory and, and, and try to be nice to revolutionaries in Italy even, uh, had such bad effects that he became even more of a hardliner than Gregory the Sixteenth. <laughs> so he was a tremendous disappointment for everyone who voted for him as, uh, as the softliner. And then, so it happened to the after he died that Pope Leo XIII was elected as a softliner. So he, he himself was initially elected as that, but then the response to him ended up being a softliner. So yeah, we're getting centuries ahead of ourselves here, but it's interesting to talk about those things. So making connections with the future. Okay, so to second, so to support the pontiff in the uh, arduous and difficult task which he had undertaken, Divine Providence was preparing a powerful army of new auxiliaries, the, the Jesuits, in fact, whose institution dates from the period when Paul III was inaugurating his reign. So, of course, and we, we tend to complain a lot about the Jesuits for problems that they caused in theology um, and other things that they did, too. But at the same time, they, they did have a good start, obviously. There were saints among their founders. So they they started well, and they have to be to be sure they've had a in, in many ways uh, in many cases uh, a, a glorious they have a, a glorious uh, record uh, in the service of the church. We have well, of course we have the pictures of the of the North American martyrs who were all Jesuits, either priests or or oblates in some way connected to the Jesuit order, or it's in the refectory. Uh, and of course, they, if you read their lives, it was absolutely just, it's, it, it's, it's mind blowing <laughs> with any, uh, what they went through. Anybody who has read that book knows, and, or even uh, had it read to you uh, in the refectory, uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, uh, of course, the Jesuits were founded at this time, then this means that St. Ignatius of Loyola was living at this time. And he was reared at the court of Ferdinand the Catholic. So. The, uh, the, whose wife was famous Queen Isabel, and in the suite of the Duke of Nahara. So he, he, had, a, he would have had a noble upbringing, St. Ignatius. And of course, uh, anyone who's, who's read it, anything, anything much at all about the life of St. Ignatius knows that uh, it was in, a, in battle, and in, in fact, in the, in the defense of the city of Pamplona against the French in 1521, that he received wounds in both legs, which obliged him to give up his military profession. And of course, that kept him bedridden for a while, in which state he started reading, well, first he started reading this you know, silly romantic novels, or whatever they had at the time, but then ended up, of course, studying lives of the saints and studying sacred scripture, meditating upon sacred scripture. And that's what brought about his conversion in a sense. Of course, he had grown up Catholic, but uh, conversion in a sense from from being a fairly worldly person, uh, if not particularly scandalous, uh, then uh, some degree a worldly person uh, into a saint. So in that sense, he underwent a conversion at this time. So he tore himself away from his home and his, his kindred, his, meaning his family, and uh, withdrew into a solitude for a while. But he began to desire a more active life fairly soon, which makes sense. He must have he seems to have been rather choleric. He was a soldier, 
and uh, his whole life was, you can see very clearly that he was rather choleric. Uh, founding religious orders, things like that, is something that cholerics tend to do. <laughs> he, uh, so he withdraws into solitude for a while, but uh, he wants to get back out into the field fairly quickly. Or for after some time, he went on a sort of retreat, but then he got back in action after a while. So he, in fact, wanted to go to Jerusalem and convert the unbelievers there, of course, meaning the Muslims. That didn't work out quite so well, so he returned to Spain, and then after that went to France uh, to study, and he, in fact, he studied theology, uh, and it was there that he, he, uh, he met uh, one Peter Faber and also St. Francis Xavier, uh, which really solidified him in the direction he was already going. So... Uh, the three friends, uh, together with several other young men um, whom they had convinced to join them, uh, went, went one day to the church of Montmartre, so the, the Mount of the Martyrs. And uh, so Peter Faber, who was already a priest, he had already received holy orders, said Mass, after which they all took a vow of chastity and poverty and swore to dedicate, or to devote their lives to the care of Christians and to the conversion of Saracens. Of course, Christians were not uh, disregarding the fact that Luther has hijacked the term even at this time. So the Order of Jesuits dates from that day, the August 15th, 1534. The Feast of the Assumption in 1534. So that's a good date to remember. Right. So usually when uh, church history is especially interesting, it's usually because it's about people doing uh, scandalous things, the church battling against people doing scandalous things. But in this case, I do, we, we do actually, I believe we do actually have an instance of something being at once uh, uh, edifying and at the same time highly interesting. Because usually the more edifying things are, uh, let's say they capture the imagination a little less, but this is actually... a uh, I don't want to say sensational, but highly interesting. Uh, you know, it's more more gripping in that sense, but also at the same time, much more edifying than listening to Martin Luther's absurdities or or Henry VIII's antics. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Amen, Subtuum Presidium, Confugimus, Sancta Dei Genitrix, Nostras Deprecationes in Dispicias, in the Necessitatibus, Sera Periculis, Cunctis, Liberanus, Semper, Virgo, Glorios et Benedicta. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Amen.